Hi, everybody. My name is Christian Talbot. I am the president of the Middle States Association, and thank you for joining us today for a conversation with Adam Bryant about the leap to leadership. I want to say a word about what success will look like for us today and why we're here, and then introduce Adam, and then we're going to start with our conversation. So we're here as part of this change makers in education theme for middle states in which we're exploring those issues that are most central to facilitating and leading change in schools all around the world. And for those of you who are joining us who are not yet members of the Middle States Association, we have about 3000 members in places all around the world. And I know many of them are here today. So thank you for joining us again. And uh, this particular topic about talent and change leadership is what we consider one of the tectonic shifts going on. It's what we call a force at play in the world that's reshaping not just education, but really the entire uh, landscape of, of leadership. So for today, success for us means that you'll have a keener understanding of that shifting landscape around talent. And second, how that leap to leadership from early stages of career to middle and later stages of, of leadership are also now connected to interesting things going on with how to lead change in organizations. And then finally, uh, we'll talk about some practical steps that you can make and that you can encourage others make to make in that leap to leadership. So it's my great uh, honor and privilege to introduce Adam Bryant. Adam is the Senior Managing Director and also a partner at the Exco Group. Exco is a global consulting firm, and Adam has been integral to their growth over the last few years. Exco addresses what they call uh, the changing role of organizations in society, the shifting nature of work, and the scope of leadership itself. And nobody's better equipped to think about and share insights on the scope of leadership itself than Adam. Um, I'm sure you know him uh, if you've signed up for this, this webinar. He's the author of several books on executive leadership, starting with The Corner Office and Quick and Nimble from his, his days at the New York Times. Uh, a couple of years ago, The CEO Test, which he co-authored with Kevin Scherer. And then just a few months ago, The Leap to Leader, which is the primary focus of today's conversation. And finally, the last thing I'll say is that if you're not following Adam on LinkedIn, He's uh, also the author of several interview series. It's kind of hard to keep up with his work, but every single interview is rich with insights. And if you're not already signed up to receive those, I strongly encourage that you do so. So Adam, thank you so much for joining us today for this conversation. Thanks for the invitation, Chris. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, likewise. Well, I wanna start with something that's timely and topical. So last week, the leaders of Harvard and MIT and Penn testify before the United States Congress. And already one of those leaders, the president of Penn has resigned because of uh, not just her testimony, but probably a lot of things leading up to that testimony. Um, all three of them were under fire for the conversations that are going on on their campuses and really around the world related to uh, the conflict in Israel and Palestine. And you know, putting aside their particular points of view, the fact that they were called before Congress um, and really put in front of the firing squad, uh, it reminded me of something that you write about early on in The Leap to Leader. And you say that if there's a single thread that runs through leaders, you've discovered, it's this quality of being drawn to the fire. And I'm curious if you were surprised to discover that as the common denominator among the many people whom you've interviewed. And by now I've interviewed more than a thousand leaders. And uh, to be clear, my focus is always trying to understand them as human beings first and never ask them any questions about their particular companies or organizations or their strategies, really trying to understand them and early influences and what makes them tick. And I, I just found over the years, like I became curious myself, like, why do you want to do this? Why, where does your drive come from? Um, because I think if, if we really look at these 
a lot of these leadership jobs, you know, it's purely job descriptions. It's easy for people to say like, why would anybody want to do this job, right? Like, obviously there's perks and benefits that come with it and some, you know, a lot of status, et cetera. But I think pre-pandemic leadership was incredibly hard. I, I've always felt it's the hardest thing to do well on the planet. Um, I think leadership in the last few years has gotten pick a number five to 10 times harder. We can argue about the number, but I think we can all agree it's become a lot harder. And I would say that the hardest jobs in leadership are probably education leadership jobs, right? Because there's just, there's so many constituents and stakeholders. Um, and uh, and I think what we've seen just this past week in Congress is just a reminder of just how hard those jobs are. Um, and I've always been curious, just this phrase, I've been drawn to the fire has come up over and over when I've asked people essentially, why do you want to do this? Um, and then trying to understand where that comes from. And some of it's nature, some of it's nurture. A lot of the leaders that I've interviewed over the years faced a tremendous amount of adversity when they were younger. And I think it just becomes like this habit of mind, like the, when there is something difficult, they feel like they can get through it. Um, I think some people, you know, a lot of people have some version of the immigrant story where they are the first in their families to do something. And because they've spent so much of their lives being the first and creating a path that that becomes almost a comfort zone for them. Um, so again, it's endless mystery and fascination for me about why people want these jobs, but uh, the fact that they want them, um, you know, I, it, it, it is interesting because we do get these constant reminders of just how difficult they are and how, you know, the idea that there's, you know, some right answer, there's no right answer for these leadership challenges, right? And, and we, we get these reminders all the time, particularly in this environment. You know, I, I asked a few friends who are in education leadership positions about this topic of being drawn to the fire. And it was interesting that the sort of sub theme for them and for me is uh, a feeling of, of needing to put something right, that the fire represents something that's either broken or just ineffective in the system, uh, whether the system is a school or a district or a wider educational landscape and feeling like, not that there aren't other people out there who can do it, but that we feel particularly drawn to that fire. Um, and, you know, Liz McGill obviously got burned badly by that fire, but I'm sure she'll end up in another leadership role soon. And, um, and uh, you know, again, whatever we think of, of the testimonies of those three leaders last week, um, they clearly all three were willing to, to step into that fire. Um, and I'm sure that... Yeah. And, 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 and to be clear, I mean, the fire of, of education is an important one to be drawn to, right? I mean, there is potential for impact. There's, you know, I, I always companies of all kinds and all kinds of industries um, spend a lot of time coming up with purpose statements and mission statements. But, you know, one of the advantages of being in the education field is that you don't have to overthink that, right? Like there is a clear and obvious mission, purpose, and how you can help society and what the tremendous need is there. So, yeah. Um, by the way, for the audience, we are encouraging you to, to, contribute to the chat. There's also an interactive Google Doc that's linked in the chat. And um, Adam, for your benefit, the the opening question in the chat is, who's the best leader you've worked for and how do they influence you? So you may uh, finish this webinar with a, a few more uh, items for your for your research. Um, I want to take a step back, Adam, and, and ask you why you chose at this point in your career to write Leap to Leader, because so much, really almost all of your previous work seemed to focus on the highest, the very highest levels of executive leadership. So what was it that that drew you to this particular fire? Sure. And two, two things in particular. So my previous book, as you mentioned, was called The CEO Test. Um, and I wrote that with Kevin Sher, the former CEO of Amgen. And it's not just for CEOs, to be clear. We asked and tried to answer the question, what are the challenges that make or break all leaders? And then what can we learn from CEOs about how to navigate those challenges? And we identified seven core challenges. Doesn't matter if you're managing a team of five or a CEO of a 500,000 employee company, we really tried to figure out, okay, what are the core challenges? And if I had to put a post-it note on that book, it's essentially what do leaders do and what do they need to do? Um, and I found coming out of that, that there was like, I started thinking about this framework about how leadership is both an external game and an internal game. And so I felt like CEO test was our best answer 
at sort of what is the external game of leadership? What do you need to do? And I just found there's this other thing that kept drawing me. It's like, okay, what is the internal game? And if if we ask the question, what do you, how do you need to be as a leader? That just found, that question just kept pulling me. And again, felt like it needed a good counterpart to the CEO test and lead to leaders much more internal. Like what is the internal work that you need to do? to become a leader and it, because it's not about a title. So that was one big draw for me. The other one is just in the work that we do with our firm, we're inside Fortune 20 companies, private equity, VC, family businesses. Um, we work a lot with heads of talent and heads of HR. And one of the most consistent themes that we've heard in recent years is that every organization needs their managers to step up to be leaders. Um, and you know, there are a ton of definitions about well, what's the difference between managers and leaders, and people have a lot of glib answers. I think there's a lot of answers, but the one that um, I often come back to is just this idea that when you're a manager, there's a little bit of a sense of expected outcomes, like we're giving you the playbook and some resources, we want you to execute the playbook. But I think we're very much in this environment where there's so many new problems for which there is no playbook. Um, and companies need their managers to, you know, in effect, saying to them, look, we need your help in writing this playbook. We can't give you the script, the template for how to have this typical, this difficult conversation. Um, we can give you some guidelines, but we need your thinking and we need you to help sort of own some of these challenges. Because I, I often talk about the fact that one of the reasons I think leadership is so hard is that it is a series of paradoxes and contradictions. And when you're a manager, it's easy to feel like, you know, I'm getting a lot of mixed messages. You're sort of telling me to like be empathetic and compassionate, but drive a culture of accountability and and create a sense of urgency, but I have to be patient. Like, which is it? And I, I think the core insight for leaders is that those are not or propositions, those are and propositions. All those things that feel like mixed messages are why leadership is so hard. And, and leaders own those paradoxes. They don't sort of point their fingers up and say, well, you guys decide and figure out which one it is. There's more of a sense of, okay, this is why leadership is hard. And I need to own those and figure those out and navigate those. Yeah. You said a few things that I just want to pull out for emphasis. One is this idea that um, although the title of your previous book is The CEO Test, it's really an exploration of leadership. And um, it was interesting before this webinar, we had sent out uh, one of the marketing emails we sent out, invited people to answer just a one question survey, which was on a scale of one to 10 from, you know, you tell me what the playbook is and I'll do it exactly like you tell me to 10, like I create the playbook and I run it. And it was really interesting. We got a, a huge volume of responses to that that question. And the average score was 8.13, um, which I found encouraging, really encouraging, because as you said, there's so much uncertainty, so many problems that no one's ever seen before or been prepared for. And uh, to know that the people who are responding anyway, probably a self-selective group, you know, are are seeking uh, to write the playbook when, when it's necessary. Um, but you also said something about the external game versus the internal game. And I know you've, I want to use that as a segue to a, another question. I, I know you've you've had the opportunity to interview a number of higher education leaders. So maybe not in the same space that Middle States is in, which is K-12, but I, th I think there's there are plenty of transferable lessons. And I'm curious, you know, are, are there any common themes about the internal game that those leaders have played as education leaders um, that really stand out for you? Yeah, and sort of back to the drawn to the fire, right? And and it is a bigger and more challenging fire, I think, to be an education leader than to lead, say, you know, a tech company that's producing a single product, right? And again, I don't need to tell you or all the folks on this webinar about the challenges of your roles, but I think it, at the core of it is this idea that there are just so many constituents, right? And everybody's got their own agenda. So how do you create a sense of how do you create a sense of us at, at sort of the broadest scale, right? Because especially when you, and I have interviewed a lot of university presidents and, you know, some of the themes that come up most often, one of them is that very often they've started out as professors, right? Sort of solo contributors. 
and very much the culture of like one and done. Like I've written this paper or and and I'm done with it. And one of the key lessons that they tell me that they've had to learn many times the hard way is just the importance of repetition and 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 this idea that there is no such thing as over communication and that's a new muscle that they've had to build again coming from a time where it's like i wrote that paper i'm not talking about it anymore um uh and communicating in a lot of different ways and in in many ways sort of saying the same thing over and over again the reality of being a leader is that it's a little bit like being a politician. You have to be very comfortable having a stump speech and and always making sure like you're passionate and enthusiastic about it um, every single time. I think the other thing, the really key insight for me is goes back to this idea of like, how do you create that sense of us when very often people in like, especially universities they they define us in much smaller tribes, right? So you might be a member of a department in a particular school in a broader university. And so you might define that sort of us circle, that tribe pretty small in, in a small way. And maybe if you're a professor, it's like, I just want to do what I want to do, right? Like you, you actually don't see an us beyond just wanting to do what you do. Um and I often go back to a story that uh, Drew Gilpin Faust told me when she was um, at Harvard and sort of stepped into the role and was addressing this question of, okay, we've got a bunch of different schools at Harvard and, and they sort of self-identify as us. How do we get them to see themselves in, in, a, in a broader group? And she was given a great prompt of a question, which I often use when I'm running offsites too. And she asked the group of deans of the different schools, what unfair advantage do you have by being a part of Harvard University. And I think it's just a great prompt, a great provocation to make them think it's like, okay, yes, I'm running my school really effectively. And um, but but you know, getting moving up to a higher altitude. Um another great expression that comes up that captures this idea. I interviewed a CEO, um, Helene Gale, who's now the president of Spelman, um, and she often talked about this idea of being a dual citizen, that she wants people on her leadership team to be dual citizens so that you have, yes, your functional expertise, the area that you are in charge of, but you also have to wear a broader organization hat, enterprise hat. And I think that insight is important in the world of business. I think it's important in the world of education that everybody needs to be a dual citizen. And like with all the work I do, I mean, just a great metaphor, a great insight that sort of captures a big idea in a couple of words, because everybody, when they hear dual citizen, it's like, OK, I get what that means. Yeah, but there's so much in what you just said that I want to highlight, but I'll just I'll, I'll keep it focused on on the idea that the um, the leader of any educational community is really um, trying to define us in a way that is kind of irreducibly difficult, as you said earlier in this conversation, there's so many different stakeholders to manage. And in a polarized age, that's harder than it ever was. And there's this interesting tension between, at least in my experience, those education leaders who have great vision and those who want to kind of serve the people. Um, and, you know, when you have a strong, clear vision, it often does alienate or at least marginalize a certain percentage of a community, which is a dangerous thing for an education leader to do, and yet um, maybe one one very concrete skill, as you as you pointed out, is the importance of repetition. I know for sure that uh, going from the classroom to uh, to school leadership, I it took me a very long time to understand the importance of delivering the message many 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 times. And and I know in one of your corner office interviews from years ago, you interviewed someone who said that. Um, when when people start finishing my sentences for me and tell me they're sick of hearing it, that's when I know I've done it. I've said it just enough, just enough. One last exactly. question, Adam, on on um, something specific from the book before we turn to the topic of change leadership and the way in which the book kind of maybe anticipates some change leadership issues is, again, early on um, after that, uh, you know, that question of, of of the, of making the leap to leadership, you you start actually really kind of in a way start the book with a kind of a, a surprising question, which is, do you really want to lead? And the word "really" is actually italicized in the book. So right. uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I, I'm I'm often struck 
struck by the fact that people move into some big new job and there's a little bit of a like, wow, I didn't know what I was getting into here, right? Because let's be honest, you move up into those bigger roles and basically your day is chewed up, putting out fires. You're dealing with a lot of people problems, right? You don't have time to do your work at work. So you get up in the morning, you've got 100 to 300 emails and then you put out fires and you've got to line out your door of people problems all day long. And then there's the sort of third shift at the end of the day. Um, and I, you know, in terms of the mentors that we work with in our firm and the clients, it's just, I just kept hearing about this pattern more often. And, and I, I started thinking about that and, you know, why do people move into these top jobs? And I, I think one of the, re there's a, there's a couple of rivers that sort of, to me, create this momentum that carry people into these bigger jobs um, and I know we're this is sort of education community, but there's probably some parallel that so in the in the business world, especially large companies, they start looking at leadership development, succession planning, their talent pipeline. They'll you'll see a lot of slides with names on faces or you know faces and names, and we see these people moving into the next tier of jobs in the next few years. And and pretty much never does anybody in all those conversations say, did we check with these people to say whether they really want these jobs, right? There's kind of an assumption that, of course, you want this job. Um, and then the other river that I think carries people into these jobs is just sort of, you know, human nature and the society we live in where, where you get the sort of status, like you get a bigger title, um, you get more money, more benefits. If you actually go to an office, you'll get a bigger office. And I think people just naturally want those things. And and I always I always encourage younger leaders, it's like, be very clear about why you want these jobs, right? And there is there is an interesting parallel in education. I'm often struck by, especially in this day and age, you know, when high school seniors or juniors start thinking about college, it's like, you got to go to like 10 campuses, right? And with your parents and at every minute, it's like, well, how do you feel about how you feel? Like, do you think this might be a good fit? And people do all this research to go to a, a college that it's like, what, what's not to like, right? You know, your parents are probably paying full boot to have four years of classes and hanging out with your friends. And so there's all this research to find, is this going to be a good fit? And yet we don't really do that in once we're in our careers. And so I always encourage people, like, if there is a job you think you want, do as much research as possible to find out what that job feels like, um, what typical day-to-day -day is, um, so that you're not surprised. And you're always going to be a little surprised. There's always going to be a difference between the theory of the job and actually having your knees under the desk once you're in that job. Um, but as much as you can try and close that gap and, and, you know, just at a personal level, like I've turned down a couple of promotions in my career. Um, and partly because, you know, for a couple of years, I sat three feet from, I was the deputy to the per the department head uh, at the New York times. And, you know, you sit three feet from somebody for two years and see what they do all day. And it's like, a, I don't want to do that. B, I don't think I'd be very good at it. Um, and I'm just not the right person for it. So, uh, Again, I always encourage people like just take out a blank piece of paper, write the question at the top. Why do you want to lead and just spend some time with yourself? And, you know, if it's just about if it is about money, if it is about status, it's like I'm not saying those aren't important, but just know that those probably aren't going to feel like they're enough once you're into the job because the jobs are really challenging. Yeah, so. I have the book here and for everybody's reference, if you're, if you have the same version I have page three, basically most of page three of the book is a series of diagnostic, what I consider to be diagnostic questions. Um, you talked about the playbook question. Are you comfortable you know, creating the playbook and not just running the playbook? Um, but there are other questions here about, you know, to what degree, for example, are you comfortable being fully accountable? To what extent does people's, does someone's respect matter to you more than whether they like you? And there's probably, I don't know, a good 10 or 12 questions or implicit questions on this, on this page in this book. And one of the things, Adam, you know, because we've talked about this, that I, I, I deeply admire about your writing, is it is eminently practical and applicable. And you know, this question of, you know, do you really want to lead uh, is not, you're, you're not doing it in a hand wavy kind of way. Like there's, there's something very tangible about it. So I really value, that's one of the many things I value about the book. So uh, let's, let's shift to this question of, of change leadership. So my, my point of view is that every leader 
in schools and otherwise. Um, and whether you have positional authority or you're you're leading through influence has to be a change leader. Like we we just can't afford for people in leadership not to be willing to lead and facilitate change. So in your in your model of of someone making that leap to leadership, are there any insights that you can offer the audience about how to prepare to lead change? Um, even if you're not fully there at the front of the line. Yeah. Um, a, a few thoughts on this, um, more than a few thoughts, but I'll keep it to a few thoughts. I, I, I have found in the leadership space that it's very easy for ideas to get to sort of a very high altitude um, and become somewhat disconnected and less concrete than they need to be. Um, and it's very easy when people start talking about change management in the future, and maybe you have an offsite and maybe you have a facilitator. Um, we just, I've seen this movie too often and probably a lot of the people on this call have as well, but you start looking for those mission and vision and purpose statements and strategy document. And the pattern that I've seen again is sort of, they, they become so high altitude um, that they feel somewhat disconnected from what actually needs to be done and, and where you're going. And the key, some of the key tests for me, if if you come up with these statements and absolutely nobody can argue with them and take any issue with them, they're probably not all that effective. Um, I've also feel like in the last few years that um, so many organizations have really doubled down on coming up with a purpose statement. Either they're voicing their purpose statement more or revisiting that question. Um, and again, I see this pattern where they're A, they're somewhat disconnected. And the other concern I have is that a lot of the purpose statements are really ultimately about intent. And they're sort of kind of the language of politicians, because if Look, let's be honest, a lot of purpose statements at some level or some version of make the world a better place, right? Which is ultimately about intent. Um, and I think that if you shift the conversation to impact instead of purpose, I think that creates an ultimately better conversation, more productive. It gets into accountability. Um, and it also shifts the conversation that, you know, words do matter, right? And and so I think there's a world of difference between purpose and impact. I also think there's a world of difference between the words priorities and outcomes. Hmm. And I've seen a lot of strategy documents that, and they talk about priorities, right? And very often those lists of priorities, get, you know, there's a creep that comes in, right? You know, they may have started as five and suddenly they become 12 and it's like, why not go to 18, right? And again, these sort of priorities that nobody can argue with, they're all important. Um, and one of the patterns that I started seeing is that, that a lot of these bullet point lists of priorities, they started with the same two words, and those two words were continue to. And I started thinking, it's like, well, if you're going to continue to, it probably always was important, it probably always will be important. And so, yeah, there are priorities, but that's not actually a strategy document. And I'm using strategy sort of synonymous for change management, right? Like we need to continue to evolve and grow. And so when I'm working with leadership teams, I often say like, you, you need to remove the word priorities from your vocabulary and you need to substitute the word outcomes instead. Because if you start talking about impact and outcomes, that really grounds the conversation. And what do we actually need to do? It's a time bound period. It might be two years, five years, whatever it is. But it's like, what do what are we trying to achieve? How are we going to measure it? What are the three things that are really going to make a difference and that we can look back and say, well, we really succeeded, which to me is it, it's much more grounded in the actual day to day work than you know, purpose and mission and vision statements, which I don't mean to, to knock those too much, but I've just seen too often people go through that as an exercise and there's, okay, box checked, and they never really think about them anymore um, or talk about them anymore. The final point that I'll make, um, and this is based on an insight that I, I got from former colleagues at the New York Times, which went through a pretty significant transformation, is that you have to separate mission from tradition. Um, and let me explain what what that means. Um, I have, the other thing I've noticed with a lot of strategy documents, especially in the last few years, the metaphor that I use is that they become like pack mules. 
right? They're being asked to carry 20 times their own weight because they get loaded down with not just the strategy stuff, but everything else, purpose, mission, vision, culture, um, you know, stakeholder capitalism, um, DE and I, and all of those things are important, but those things all get mixed in with the actual strategy of the organization. So one of the most powerful slides that I put up when I'm working with leadership teams is a very simple slide. There's a line down the middle. And on one side, it says what is going to change. And on the other side, it says what is not going to change. And I find that's very effective for taking a lot of the weight off the poor pack mule that's carrying 20 times its own weight in a strategy document. Because those are two separate conversations and they're equally important. But if you first address, okay, like what is not going to change, that becomes like your like your values as an organization, you know, what everybody can agree on that is not going to change, regardless of all the change in how you do what you do and everything that's going on in the world. Once you put that in that parking lot, then you can say, all right, what is going to change? And it becomes a much sort of cleaner and more focused conversation. Yeah, so many great insights. Again, the first one that comes to mind is building on the last thing you said. Um, and for the audience's benefit, you know, Adam writes for Harvard Business Review. The book was published by, by Harvard Business Review. And there was an article a few years ago about change management and change leadership and starting with that conversation of what is not going to change partly for the sake of um, reassuring people emotionally who are very invested in certain things, um, but also because it does help to separate uh, you know, the, the values from the impact that you're seeking. I think another thing that I want to um, build on that you said, Adam, is, uh, and I see this a lot in schools, like the, the challenge of translating um, aspirational ideas or very kind of high level ideas that ultimately become disconnected into real ground level initiatives that are not just continuing to do what we've always done, but is maybe two or 3% better, which is fine. And actually, if you do that long enough, you can get really great, great results. But um, in schools, we tend to focus a lot on intent um, because we are very mission driven places where we care for kids. Um, typically, and and priorities. Um, and one of the hardest challenges I see school leaders facing is the desire of the community for a school to be everything to everyone, which means you're not really making choices. Um, and ultimately, we I think we all know intellectually that if you try to be everything to everyone, then you end up being not very good at lots of those things or even all of those things. So I just want to emphasize what you said that um, change leaders, especially as they're they're moving up in leadership roles, should be thinking about shifting from intent to impact. Not that you're leaving the intent behind, but that you're going to place the focus on what's the impact that I and we are seeking, and then shifting from priorities to outcomes. And you know, I was just sort of quickly scanning the chat as you were making that comment, and and someone wonders, uh, Ole, uh, wonders whether priorities are the work of managers and outcomes are the work of leaders. Um, I don't know if that's a, you know, a provocation to respond to now or later, but um, it does, it is connected to what you said. Yeah. And my short answer is just ask yourself, what would happen if you change that word? I mean, have the same conversation two ways and just find if the conversation is different, taking a different course. Because again, priorities to me has this sort of evergreen, it tends to pull everybody up to a very lofty place. The other pattern that I've seen with lists of priorities from companies is that they often become sort of an opportunity to give a shout out to everybody on the leadership team, right? So one priority is like attract and retain world-class talent, HR, check. Uh, well, what about marketing? Don't, you know, I'm the chief marketing. Don't I get it? Like, of course, like create world-class marketing. And and again, ultimately nobody argues with it, but it's not about driving the organization to a specific outcome or goal, which is the job of leaders and it's the job of managers. So again, we can have an endless dinner party debate about it, but my question is um, test it yourself. How does the conversation change when you substitute the word outcomes for priorities. Yeah. You know, you said something interesting there that makes me think about a challenge that's probably true in all sorts of organizations, but feels again, especially acute or true in schools, which is 
if there are lots of priorities, it's an opportunity to shout out everyone. And, you know, schools are places of community and caring. Um, and I've often experienced the desire for um, kind of like social proof and social conformity uh, in ways that that often kind of keeps things stuck in a status quo. So if we're recognizing everybody for everything, um, in a way, it's kind of a way of saying that everything matters equally, but that can't possibly be true if you're driving change, right? If you're driving change, something has to matter more than other things. And that I find is a really difficult position for a school leader to take because it means willing to be unpopular. And again, earlier in the book, you ask, you know, do you want to be respected or do you want to be liked? And that's a, that's a, feels to me like another irreducible challenge. Exactly. And, and to that point, I mean, I, this is a old chestnut in the leadership field, but somebody said, you know, strategy is what you don't do. Right. So, and, and that just underscores this idea that you have to make choices. And I think for school leaders, you know, one of the additional challenges you face is that you've got so many constituents and everybody's got a pretty clear opinion about what's best for them and for their child, et cetera. Um, and so I, I, I think so much of leadership does come down to those moments where you are on a stage, whether it's literal or virtual. Um, but there's those leadership moments where you just need to explain to everybody, we can't be everything to everybody. Um, we have to make choices. Not every one of them is going to be popular. But then if you if you then shift to the outcomes and the impact you're after, that's a way to sort of ground the conversation. And maybe not everybody is going to nod. But if we all say it's like, hey, everybody, just a reminder, the outcomes we're after, the impact we want to have is for these students. And this is what how we're going to measure it. And that's what best for the students to me, that's probably the best way to disarm people a little bit and go, okay, I'm going to get outside my own little agenda. And uh, that's an important reminder about why we're here. Yeah. Well, on that topic, one of the things that I personally and, and middle states institutionally has come around to in the last year is that um, it's tremendously important for us to help schools to lead change that that is human led, but AI informed or and AI informed. Um, and I, I feel like it's impossible to talk about this question of change leadership without asking what you're hearing from leaders across industries about how particularly generative AI is changing the nature of, of what they're, they're doing as leaders. Yeah, I, I'd love to pretend I'm an expert and I'm not, I mean, I, there's so many great metaphors about this moment we're living in. Some people like you liken, um, this moment to you know the sort of dawn of electricity like as a way of underscoring just how transformative it's going to be for us um i think the point that i i will make I, i've i've long believed and i've written that one of the core skills of leaders is to simplify complexity right and again those sort of leadership moments where you're on a stage literal or virtual and you say look this is who we are. This is where we're going. This is how we're going to get there. This is the big goal. And to be able to do that requires certain skills, right? To take all the complexity in the world and your field and your particular community environment, the context you're operating in and boil it down to sort of very simple model that people can remember and understand, right? That is a leadership moment. I think I would add a new beat to this idea of simplifying complexity, which is you also have to embrace complexity. And I maybe there's some AI experts at the, on this call right now, but I, I feel like all of us are probably in the same boat where we're reading headlines and we're seeing snippets here and examples of, wow, it does that, I, I didn't know that. But I think all of us have to take become sort of students for ourselves about what this means, because I don't I haven't come across an article that just says this is what you need to know, right? Like there's a lot of there's a lot of hype, um, and and it's sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I feel like we're on this sort of hype roller coaster. Like some weeks it feels like AI is going to take over the world, and it's like eh, maybe not so much, right? Like there's like what what can AI do in the field of education? What can it not do? And that's going to change over time. But I just feel like it's incumbent on everybody to become students themselves. Um, and maybe there are experts out there you can learn from, but in some ways we have to build our own. This feels like one of those things that we can't just sort of take somebody's five bullet points in an article. I feel like we need to sort of piece this together for ourselves. 
Yeah, it's such you, a great. Exciting. I'd love to hear your your take, Christian. You, you probably yeah. Know more. Well, I mean, just to, again to build on what you said, it, it feels like another leadership diagnostic question. Put AI aside. AI maybe is symptomatic of any number of things that have introduced increased complexity to our lives. Are you willing to embrace complexity or are you looking for the known knowns? And, and I, I think any anybody who wants to be a leader but only wants to operate in the space of known knowns is probably going to struggle. And obviously that's related to your, your insight earlier about the playbook. Um, and I think this, this question of embracing complexity as you just said, means that the leader is not the person who knows. The leader is maybe now the person who's willing to go into the unknown and be the, the first learner or the chief learner, um, and then has the additional task of translating that learning into something that's simple for people to understand. Um, but it starts with things being really messy and chaotic. And um, yeah, I think anybody who's pretending that they know where AI is going to take us is fraudulent. I, I will say though, I think in the world of education, one thing I've I've spent a lot of time thinking about is the opportunity that particularly generative AI presents when it comes to thinking of schools in particular as places where we can teach people that what I think of as like dribbled with both hands. So there are the known knowns and you do need to know your math facts and your vocabulary and how to write a good, you know, um, essay. And, you know, there, we have rubrics for those things. We have templates for those things. We have exemplars for those things. And it's important to know that stuff. And to me, it's like when you're an athlete or a musician or a performing artist, you have practices and you have scrimmages or rehearsals. And that's where you go through those drills where those are the known knowns and that's how you consolidate your learning and you get stronger and better at those things. And then there's the performance, whether it's a game or a live musical or artistic performance where you don't know exactly what's gonna happen. And um, I think AI presents us with a great tool to explore territory that we haven't thought about before, you know, to face problems that we've never thought about before. and. Um, it's a it's an incredible potential superpower if we create the space in learning environments for the learner to say this problem matters to me, and under typical circumstances I wouldn't have the tools to be able to grapple with it. But now that I have this thing that's like an adjunct to my thinking or my doing, I can explore that space. So yeah. I feel like and, you know that's maybe an abstract way of talking about it, but yeah. And and my only build on that is just sort of this insight that in this environment that I think one of the most powerful tools of leadership right now is is asking really smart questions because in this environment, a good question is worth 10x a good answer because answers change, right? But the good question for not only yourself, but also for the organizations and institutions you're leading Questions give long-term focus, right? By you saying, this is a key question that we are going to have to try to answer and the answers are going to change over time, but it's just a way of establishing focus. It's a way of saying, this is important to us and, and we need to collectively come up with the answer. Um, and leaders, uh, uh, one of the big shifts, I think, is that, you know, decades ago, people felt like to be a leader, you had to have the answer. And, and to me, you know, the leaders today is the person who asks the best questions. Yeah, totally. Um, I want to leave time for audience questions, but I want to ask you one more myself before turning to some of the audience questions. And that's, again, to just be very practical about things. And I know you don't have domain expertise in schools, but, um, you know, just to paint a picture of the landscape, the the average tenure of a superintendent is shrinking. It's down to something like five years. The average tenure of a head of school or a principal is down to something like four years. Um, there's a nationwide and in some places like globally a, a teacher shortage. Um, so the, the talent crisis is real. And if you were advising uh, school leaders who are in a position to spot, recruit, hire, and develop talent for a long-term view, to borrow the phrase you just used, what advice would you give them? What what practical, concrete steps could they take now? 
I, I think the simplest one that leaps to mind is is just to build it into the calendar, right? And I don't mean the school calendar, sort of holidays and the like. I mean that if you're a school leader, to say on some some cadence that I am going to be hosting conversations about leadership. I'm not going to be talking at you. I'm going to be hosting those conversations. Find out who shows up, mm. right? Because you want people who, you know, I always feel like in life, there's only three buckets. There's want, should, and need, right? And you want to, you want to invite those people in who are interested, genuinely interested in leadership, who maybe want to be leaders. And I think by doing that, it sort of signals that it's important to the culture of the school. Um, and I think that's a good way to find, you know, bring people into that conversation because it's so easy. And again, all of you are living these jobs every day. I don't need to tell you. It's just putting out fires all day long. There's all these standing meetings and things like your calendars look like Tetris games, right? And they sort of, you know, fill themselves. Um, and so you just need to take control of that and say, I need to send a signal that leadership is important at this school. And whatever that is, like hosting monthly coffees around it. Um, I think that's one way to do it. I also, look, Christian, I'm, I've been in the leadership space, I guess, about 13 years now. Um, I I will confess to you in this group that I'm getting a little cranky about the space insofar as, um, uh, you know, at the risk of stating the obvious, I think there's a lot of empty calorie um, stuff in the leadership space. And a lot of it is around sort of packaging and branding. People love to put brand new words in front of the word leadership, like they're inventing something, you know, strategic leadership. And people have all sorts of Venn diagrams and um, that they're trying to use to explain everything about leadership. And and I, I would just encourage everybody on this call to um, have some health, healthy skepticism, because if you find yourself saying, okay, I want to have this leadership conversation, but like, how do I do that? Do I start a book club? I mean, yes, use my books, but I'm just talking about generally um, uh, that, that I, you want to do it in a way that feels constructive. And so, you know, again, like the, the, to me, it's like the skeptics field guide to the leadership field. Um, I would I would offer these sort of watch outs is like just be skeptical of somebody who's selling you in effect kind of a religion like okay my I have come up with this proprietary approach to leadership right and here's my Venn diagram and you have to use my language and I've put this new adjective in front of the word leadership I think you should be skeptical of that um, I think you know, the best conversations to me is they start with the idea that leadership is is highly contextual um, and it's highly personal, right? And and sometimes because leadership is so hard, people start reaching for, it's like, well, what about this? It's almost like, can I buy this suit off the rack and put it on? Um, there's a lot of sort of cookie cutter advice in the leadership space and whether it's a Venn diagram or five bullet points, the key to leadership is dot, dot, dot. Um, and leadership is more complicated, right? The, it depends on the environment you're working in. It depends on you and your personality and your background as a leader. And it depends on the personalities of your leading, of the people you are leading. So just point one is it's highly contextual. It's highly personal. And I think that my, my respectful submission to the group, I'm happy to debate anybody about this all day long, is that if you're going to talk about leadership, I think there's only three currencies to talk about leadership. One is insights right? Share insights, discuss insights that make you feel smarter about a challenge you're facing, that some gives you a little feeling of like, this is a little Swiss army knife. I'm now smarter about this world, uh, about our environment, about the dynamic of leadership, about managing people and share stories, right? Like what has worked, what doesn't work and what lessons have you learned? And what's the story behind that? And then finally, the, the third currency is like, what are the practical tools, like approaches, frameworks, tactics, techniques that you can use to be a more effective leader? Because to me, that's the arc of a good leadership conversation. I learned this important lesson. This important insight came to me. This is how I learned it, which makes it feel real, makes it sticky, memorable. And because of that insight, because of that experience, I now do X when I'm running a team meeting or when I have a difficult conversation. Um, and everybody has to kind of like figure out your leadership approach on your own, not that you're starting with a blank slate. That's kind of why I write books to share 
insights and stories and tactics and tools and 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 everybody has to decide what makes sense for them based on not only their context but their particular personality um and to to just open up the conversation and so again i mean everybody in this call is in different space and stuff but it's just like my advice is have the leadership conversation and just have it in a way that feels very contextual and personal rather than saying to the group like we've decided to become blankety blank leaders and it's like everybody puts on their jersey and starts using this language that again it probably has like a cookie cutter feel that's probably a longer answer than you wanted. No, that's great. Um, and I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry if that sounded uh, like a bit of a rant to folks, but I, I just, again, like sort of skeptics feel guide to leadership. Those are my tips. No, that's great. I'm going to come back to that at the end. So before today's webinar, we gave folks a, a chance to ask some questions and uh, to go back to AI, I used ChatGPT to summarize and synthesize because there were so many of them and they they broke down along three themes. One is leadership skills and development. Another theme is team dynamics and trust in particular. And then the third is, is balancing leadership responsibilities with personal life. But on the first theme of leadership skills and development, um, you know, the, the executive coach and author Marshall Goldsmith famously wrote, what got you here won't get you there. And I'm wondering if there are things that, as someone is making that leap to leader from the individual contributor role, you mentioned that earlier, to the leader of people role, anything in particular you think they should keep in mind? Yeah, just as you move up, I mean, the decisions get harder, right? There's more gray areas, there's less data for using those decisions, and you need to get comfortable with the fact that A, there's a good chance you're going to be wrong, and that whatever you decide is going to make you unpopular with some constituent, and you've got to be comfortable with that. I mean, it, that is one of those things that you, you have to do a gut check, right? It's like, I got to make a big decision, I got to place a bet. Um, on how we're going to move this organization and you don't know if it's going to work and some people aren't going to be happy but like that's leadership right and and another quick point i'll call out um, is this idea of compartmentalization which i feel like people don't talk about enough with leadership that you move into these bigger roles you've got just got a lot of pressure on you i mean there's just you know a lot of uncertainty a lot of doubt a lot of people tugging at your sleeve a lot of people criticizing you second guessing you and when I talk about compartmentalization, I mean, just this idea of like, you need to be able to get that right inside your head. So you're not spending every night, you know, awake, staring at the ceiling from two to four, you know, wondering and worrying and, and having that stuff get to you. I mean, you do need a bit of a thick skin. We've all met leaders who don't seem to have any problem with compartmentalization because they have zero empathy, right? Um, but there's some people can over index the other way and you internalize this stuff. So just recognize that that is a skill to be able to do that, to say, okay, I'm gonna, gonna put that behind this closed door in the morning when I wake up, I'll take it out and then wrestle with that. But you can't let this stuff chew you up and just be aware that that is a challenge. You know, I, I want to share just a personal experience, which is early in my career as a, as a school leader, um, I had probably a much bigger ego than I, I warranted, uh, given my, my limited experience. And I struggled with um, the idea, as you said, that you're going to be wrong. You're going to make people unhappy. Um, I was used to being right and basically making people very happy through my individual contributions. But then when you're in the leader role, it's almost like the polarity reverses. And I don't know why I did this, but at some point I just decided that whenever there was a critique of me or an initiative that I was authorizing or deciding that I would just assume right from the very beginning that the person was right, that I what that I had been wrong, that I had made a mistake. And I wasn't, I, it wasn't because I actually believed it. I just treated it as like, well, let me just pretend like that's true. And what can I learn from that? What 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 do I what do I change about my point of view by just adopting that momentarily? And I would say, even when I might have ultimately come around to thinking, no, I, I don't know that that person was entirely correct. It was still a really useful first framing of a situation because if nothing else, it prevented me from getting defensive and getting into an argument and and um, you know having the temperature go up really quickly. But but I think even more importantly, it it actually did create mental space for me to see 
different possibilities. Like I put, I placed the bet over here, but I probably should have put the chips in this different spot. So I don't know if that's helpful to anybody on, on, on the, uh, on the webinar, but um, I would agree with you that there is a good chance you're going to be wrong often because you're dealing with such limited information and you're going to be unpopular. You are placing bets. So you're, you're, you're bound to, to lose some money, but, um, but if you can tell yourself, well, yeah, let's just assume that the other person is right in their critique. It might actually create some um, some new thinking and some new doing. The second theme is on team dynamics and trust building. And I feel really, uh, well, I just, I feel for the people who ask these questions because it's clear that they're, they're struggling with situations in their um, environments in which there, there's a lack of trust. So in your interviews, Adam, have you learned anything from leaders about um, how to build trust and particularly to do it in teams that are diverse? And I don't necessarily mean racially, ethnically, or in terms of gender, but just sort of like a diversity of personalities. Yeah, I think the, the, the short answer and at the risk of oversimplifying, but to me, this is like another conversation that has to be more intentional. I, I think there is this kind of assumption in the world of work that if, if you put 10 strangers together on a leadership team and you just go like, go, like you're a high performing leadership team, it's it's just not going to happen, right? Um, and I often make the jokes that I the older I get, the more that I think that dysfunctional family is a redundant phrase, right? Like, isn't every family dysfunctional at some level? And if you agree with that, then I think we can just level set and say you get 10 strangers together on a leadership team, it's going to be dysfunctional. Right, it's going to be clunky. You've just got a lot of different personalities. There's nothing more complicated than human beings, and there's nothing more complicated than that than getting a bunch of human beings to try and work together. So I think as much as you can, right out of the gate, have this sort of intentional conversation. Say, look, we're going to be clunky. We all have our different quirks, our pet peeves, our pre preferred way of working. So let's have that conversation. Let's slow down to speed up later. Let's figure out who we are as human beings um, first, and then we can become colleagues. Um, there's also, when I give talks with teams, um, trust is one of those words we could talk for like hours and there's a ton of different models about um, what trust is, but um, there is this good trust equation that I came across and it will, I'll, I'll remember where the, the book is, but they've sort of rendered trust as a mathematical equation. I think it's really powerful. So when you think about whether you trust somebody in the context of work, um, it's based on their competence, right? Are they good at their job? Plus their reliability. Do they see what they're always going to do? Do they deliver? Plus like personal connections, right? And you either have those going in, maybe you went to the same school or you know grew up in the same town, whatever, or you build those personal connections through experience of working together. So again, why do you trust somebody? They're good at their job, they're reliable, you have those personal connections, but there's a bombshell denominator. So draw the big dividing line under that. You put your perception of their self-interest. So if you feel like they might be good at their job, dependable, you went to the same college or whatever, but if you feel in your gut that they are not a team player and they are out for themselves, that's gonna undermine everything. Hmm. And I find that it's like you put that slide, that math equation on a slide, it sparks some really interesting conversations. Yeah. One thing I'll add oh. in terms of the answer is the user manual is a, is a good tool for building trust. Yes, exactly. And and the user manual is, is a sort of shorthand for this idea of let's take a pause to have the conversation about our respective work styles and preferences and quirks and pet peeves and all that so that we can understand each other. Cause I do go back to this metaphor of like with extended families, because with our extended families, we all know, like we've all got a uncle Joe who's got some quirks, right. And you sort of accommodate those. And, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's just a powerful conversation. Cause if you find that, you know, a colleague says, look, I really don't like to be interrupted. You're probably going to remember that. And you're probably not going to interrupt them. I would love to ask you one more question, but we're we're at time. So I'm just going to say thank you, Adam. I want to just quickly name three huge takeaways for me. Um, folks can lead change by shifting from intent to impact, from priorities to outcomes. And I love the, the framework you suggested at the end 
I learned this thing, this insight, because I had this experience. And so that's why I do this technique. I use this tool. It's such a great um, mental model for how to distill leadership lessons. Adam, thank you so much. This was a great, great conversation. I really appreciate it. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks to everybody. I hope it was helpful. Very much so. Thanks, everybody, for joining us.